Hi. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Yes, we are a webinar. I say this every week. You can call us that. We won't be offended by it. <laughs> um, we embrace our webinar-ness. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I made up another word. Um, where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians. The show is free and open to anyone to watch. Uh, we do the live show here Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you are unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. All of our shows are recorded and posted onto our website, and so you can go there and watch all the previous shows. And we do a mixture of things here, presentations, book reviews, mini training session, sessions, interviews, uh, basically anything that may be of interest to librarians, as I said, we want to have it on the show and share it with you. Um, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations for us, and we sometimes bring in guest speakers. And this week we have a combination of that. We have our regular monthly Tech Talk, um, Tech Talk with Michael Sowers. Michael Sowers is the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Good morning. Uh, he's here next to me. Uh, and once a month we bring him on to talk about a more techie-focused topic and share tech news of the week, of the month, sorry. Often, <laughs> not the week, the month. Uh, uh, so um, sometimes, and generally, you, you I think almost every single time you bring in a guest speaker. Generally, for this. yeah. So it's a, it's a once a month tech guest yep. thing. <laughs> so I will just hand over to you, Michael, to All right. what we have with us today. Great, thanks, Krista. Um, give a little bit of background to to how I found this presentation. I subscribe to a lot of blogs. I mean, a lot. And notice I said subscribe, not read a lot of blogs. Um, I skim a lot of blogs. I read a lot of headlines. I, you know, uh, if something catches my eye, well, I will read a little deeper. And in the middle of April, so about six weeks ago, um, one of the uh, uh, blog posts that came across my uh, screen uh, was called uh, a game changer uh, GAFE. And the GAFE didn't really sound uh, too familiar to me right off the top. Um, but the, the first sentence was, recently I introduced Google Apps for Education to my fourth grade students. I immediately brought up the whole blog post, uh, jumped down to the bottom to where I could leave a comment and said, hey, please, I want you on the show. Uh, because uh, we, we've had presentations on Google Apps uh, previously, I believe um, uh, uh, Jasmine uh, up in Idaho uh, has, has used Google Apps for her public library staff, but this is the first person I'd run across that was using it uh, with, with uh, kids, specifically fourth graders. That was on the Tangled Librarian blog uh, run by Cynthia uh, Stogdale. Uh, Cynthia, you're on the line with us? I am. Yeah. Good morning. She's at the Belfield Millican Park Elementary School Library in Fremont, Nebraska, so she's a local here for us. And uh, she got back to me really quick, and she said, I'd love to talk about it. So, uh, Cynthia, I'm just going to hand it on over to you and, and uh, let you tell us uh, what you did. Okay. All right. Well, um, the title of, of kind of my presentation today is Adventures in Google Apps for Education because I can tell you that it was definitely an adventure. And just a little bit about myself. I am a school librarian. I um, spent some time as a K-12 school librarian at Lakeview Community Schools. I am currently at Fremont Public Schools. Um, this year I was at two elementaries, K-4 buildings. And next year, I'm moving to Johnson Crossing in middle school. So I'm going to move up to 5, 6, 7, 8 next year. And I am a Nebraska EdChat co-founder on Twitter, Common Sense Media Educator, which is a wonderful resource for digital citizenship. Um, and it is all free, so I love that. I am a total tech nerd. And you can pretty much ask anybody that knows me. And then, um, like Michael said, my blog is tangledlibrarian.blogspot.com. And kind of a background on the blog, I started that blog when I became a school librarian, partly because I wanted to just remember my journey and sometimes look back and see um, how things had changed and maybe how much I had grown or just kind of celebrate my victories and remember uh, what kinds of things were happening and when they were happening and, and just to give me some perspective and also just, you know, if anybody else had ever picked up on it, they would just hopefully see that maybe they weren't the only ones um, dealing with some of the issues that, that I felt like I had found myself in. So it's been a really fun um, resource for me to go back and look and kind of watch my journey as I've um, progressed through my profession. 
So adventures in Google Apps for Education. Um, I will just tell you that Google Apps for Education, if you are a Google school, it is a power pack of resources to get things done. It is kind of a one-stop shop. Um, you can use all of those pieces, all of those components to um, help kids to communicate, to collaborate, and really teach them how to constructively manage all of their stuff, their, their documents, their email, um, to do research, all kinds of things. And it is just such a great um, resource. And one of the things that I love about it is that it is web-based. So, you know, they can work on stuff at home. And um, if you have anywhere you can get internet access, they can get to their documents. They can get to their stuff. And that's really kind of um, a cool concept because if they're working on something and they don't have a jump drive or it didn't save right at school and it's not right on the jump drive and they take it home and they don't have the same um, resource or version of Word at home and they open it up and they get, you know, garbled, garbleness and it's due tomorrow. Um, Google Apps kind of eliminates that because it is web-based and so wherever they can log on to the internet, they can log into their Google account and they can get um, to their resources and they can do their work wherever they need to do it and that's kind of a kind of a cool uh, principle for kids who are super busy and maybe go from home to home or you know are just you know whatever it is just such a great um, just a super resource for them so they can do their email there's Docs and Drive they can do Google Earth and I am going to talk just briefly about Google Classroom at the end I'm super excited about that and I'll share um, just a little bit with you um, before we're done. So one of the big things about Google Apps for Education is it is a great foundation in teaching kids about their digital footprint. You um, are able to really guide them and model what a good digital citizen is because you're teaching them email, you're teaching them how to communicate, how to collaborate, if you're collaborating on a document, no, you don't go in and, and delete somebody's stuff just to be funny. And on a document, actually, you know, I tell the kids, there's a revision history. If you go in and you delete something, number one, we can see when you did it. And number two, if you accidentally really just muck up the whole thing, we can go back to a previous version. And we can pull that back and we can kind of get us back to a starting point and it's going to be okay. So we really are able to model how to collaborate in a constructive way and to give kids feedback um, in kind of a 24-7 environment. And it really is a real-world platform. It is what they will probably use for the most part um, when they leave school. Um, they will probably use it at post-secondary. They may use it in the workplace. So it's very applicable to just life in general. And so um, it is a great foundation for teaching them um, how to get things done and how to be a good digital citizen. So my journey with Google Apps kind of started at Lakeview. Um, I introduced Google Apps to the 712 students and it was in conjunction with Noodle Tools which a lot of the ESUs in Nebraska do provide and it is a wonderful tool for research and for um, pulling together citations and notes and creating outlines and it coordinates very nicely with Google. Um, kids can kind of start their project in Noodle Tools, take their notes, get their citations, and they can dump the whole thing over to a Google account and just start working. And so it really is kind of a nice, um, nice combination. And that's kind of how I started sharing that resource was at the secondary level. And um, when I came to Fremont, um, they were just um, getting into Google Apps. Um, the 512 students were starting to use it a lot, and it was um, becoming kind of a really great resource. It was not open to the fourth graders, and um, I kept saying, oh, if you want to try it, try it with my kids. I'll do it. <laughs> I'll do it. And kind of my goal was there were some really cool um, Google, Google Earth activities that we could do if they have a Google account they can go in and they can create their own maps and kind of the book on the screen, the book mapping, Lit Trips and Beyond is an ISTE publication. Um, I did purchase that. It's um, 
a great resource for figuring out how to integrate literature and Google Maps. And you can go in and they can pin, you know, the journey of a character through a novel. It's just, it's, it's such a cool thing. And I really wanted to try to get to that point um, with our kids this year. I um, did not get to that, but we did introduce Google Apps, and so this is kind of um, the journey of that process. Um, I love my fourth graders. They were so open and they were so excited. And um, so this is just kind of a how-to and maybe some tips for if you are going to introduce it to younger students. These are kind of the things that I would suggest. And um, if I would do it again, this is how I would do it. So I wanted um, to be able to share that with you. And I was really excited when Michael asked me because um, if I can save you some time and help you kind of organize the process, um, the smoother it goes, the more excited the kids are. So for my fourth graders, they were used to seeing Google products. I used um, forms and for quizzes for some of our skills checks and some L to J stuff. And I used um, the Flubaru extension to correct those things um, because I have 125 fourth graders. So that made it really easy for me to give all the fourth graders a quick skills check, um, run Flubaru and just kind of see where we were, um, what areas are we struggling in, what concepts do I need to kind of go back and address. So they were used to seeing some of that stuff, um, but in a test taking environment. So they were pretty excited when I said, now you are you know, going to be able to use some of these resources yourself. So here's what I would do before you let them log in. I would revisit email etiquette. Um, I made the assumption that everybody knew how to email and that was not the case. So um, I would spend a little bit of time talking about why do we send an email, what are the, the mechanics of an email, the subject line, the content of the email does not go in the subject line, and um, what kinds of things do we say, and how do we start an email, how do we end an email. Um, grammar and spelling count. And we did stop and revisit that, but I kind of wish I would have touched on that um, a little bit more before we ever got to the point of logging in. Um, again, digital citizenship, I would definitely hit this hard. This is a huge thing for me. Um, I just feel like the sooner we get kids um, knowledgeable about their footprint and what they're leaving and what they're saying, um, I think just will make the world a better place. And so we talked a lot about if you send an email, you can't take it back. You have put that out there and there is no going back. And if you wouldn't say it to grandma, then don't send it. Don't say it. Um, we, you know, just were we really encourage them to use the Google apps for education purposes because this is a school account. So we did kind of try to steer them in that direction. But again, we did talk about, you know, if you're going to send somebody an email, it needs to be constructive, it needs to be meaningful. Um, if you get caught doing something inappropriate, um, you'll lose your account. And I'll make sure you lose it. And I told them that flat out, and I felt like um, they needed to understand that this is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, and it is a powerful tool for good, but it, it can possibly be used for um, things that are maybe not so good. So I wanted to really just get past the what can we do with this to what can we do with this in a constructive manner. Um, I did front load the process a little bit and I maybe would have done that a little more. Google Education has really great videos um, produced by some of their Google trainers who are actual educators and just talks about some of the different components and kind of how, you know, this is what you're going to see and this is the cool stuff you can do and you can write a paper and, and I can comment back to you, you know, at 7.30 at night if you're stuck. And I'm kind of a 24-7 kind of educator, um, maybe not 24-7, like maybe till 9.30 at night. But my students um, always kind of know that if, if you're working on something and you get stuck, you can tweet me or you can email me. and. I'll check my email fairly frequently, and if it's before, you know, 9.30 or 10 at night, 
um, if I can give you some information or you know kind of help you over a hurdle I will definitely do that so um, I would definitely show them what's possible so that they're then they're pretty excited about what the possibilities are if your district um, issues accounts with temporary passwords you really want to decide on do you want to use a standard form for those passwords when they reset um, the password to their own individual password um, initially when I did this at Lakeview we did not have a standard form and I had to reset passwords a lot um, I you know you can't if you pick John Deere boy um, I don't maybe can't help you figure out what that is I'm just gonna have to reset it where here at Lakeview um, we kind of came up with a standard form based on what they were looking for at Johnson Crossing and kind of what their format was we kind of followed suit with that and that way if they were stuck and they couldn't get into their account I could say remember we changed it to um, this format try that and oh yep then they could probably get in and, and we were fine we didn't have to dig out the form and look it up um, another thing that was really important was um, we kind of asked if we as media specialists could have access to reset passwords that hopefully would keep us from bugging the tech department multiple times during this process and they were very gracious about saying yeah we will give you access to kind of manage that so that um, if you do end up in a situation where the kids can't remember their passwords you can help them out kind of on the spot and keep them moving forward and keep them moving in with what they're working on in terms of their projects and stuff so those are the things that I would definitely do before you have them sit down at the computer and log in for the first time so first steps day one um, I see my kids generally 30 minutes twice a week and so we kind of had to stretch this process out a little bit and so the first day we just had we got logged in and that took us the whole time and then I also really wanted to stress with them um, logging out um, not to just close out of the browser log off your computer um, we did have a few situations where with some of our laptops um, the teachers had used them and they had logged out of the laptop but they were still logged into their Google account and um, so we talked about making sure that you log out of applications when you're working on them before you walk away and so we those are kind of the two things we did the first day um, the little checkbox at the bottom of the uh, one account all of Google page we talked about you know remember to check you know check it or uncheck it so that you're not gonna stay logged in all the time I didn't find that to be always reliable so I just really stressed with them before you walk away go to your name go to your email pull that box down and click log out then you know you've logged out of that Google account you can close out of your browser log off your computer and know that you're walking away and your your information is secure so we really stress that um, that first day um, go home and take some Advil um, that first day was absolutely um, overwhelming I felt like I had unleashed Pandora's box on the world and was just really um, not sure how it was going to go from there but one of the great great things about teaching kids is that they always rise to your expectations and a lot of times most of the time they absolutely blow you away so that first day I was um, pretty wiped out and it was quite a process and was really not sure how the second day was going to go but um, as you'll see the second day went much smoother um, so we got logged in the second day and their task was to send me an email and then they had a little bit of time to kind of look around and um, talk about you know find the different components that we had talked about with email and I wanted them to have the experience of sending an email um, to remind them that you know you need a subject you need to have your content in the content area not in the subject area and grammar and spelling count and it was um, an opportunity for me to model to them um, how I would respond to them and I did answer all 125 emails 
and some of the kids emailed their teacher. I think we actually gave them an option. They could email the teacher or myself. And the kids that emailed me, I did respond, and I think the ones that emailed their teachers, that also, um, they responded as well. But that was kind of the opportunity to model the email process and what it should look like. And if they, you know, sent me an email that was like, sup, Mrs. S. You know, I emailed them back and said, hey, how are you doing? I hope you're having a good day. Remember to make good choices and make sure you're using your Google account appropriately and just kind of model what I had been talking to them about previously. And then um, day two-ish, we um, opened Drive. Um, I showed them kind of where to find Drive, how to create a document. We kind of got that out of the way. And then um, I also asked their teachers. Um, I had five fourth grade teachers who were just so excited about this process. And they had um, presentations that they were going to work on. And they switched from PowerPoint to Google presentation. And um, I said, go ahead and share those presentations with the kids so that I can kind of teach them how to open an email with a shared document. And um, we were able to um, take a look at those documents. So we um, kind of back up just a smidge. Um, the day that we looked at Drive, we created a document. And I did show them how to put images into um, their word processing document. I think we opened up WorldBook Online. And I showed them how to kind of get the image and put that into their document with a citation. Um, that was my big thing. They all knew where to find a citation in WorldBook or how to use a citation. So um, that was kind of a chance for them to kind of show me what they knew and kind of learn how to move some pictures into their documents because I knew um, moving forward they were going to be doing that with their presentations. And we talked about how to delete a document. We did a little bit with sharing documents. We kind of had one document that everybody got to type on. And that was really cool. They thought that was awesome. They could see each other, you know, typing and talk to each other. And, um, but they also could see how easy it was for somebody to go in and make a big mess. And so we kind of covered that. And then recent documents, kind of how to find stuff you had worked on previously. So we did kind of hit all of those high points um, when we talked about Drive. And then I think at that point we were ready to um, have the teachers share those presentations with the kids. And we spent a day, we opened the email, we opened the shared document, and I taught them how to save a copy of that document as their own so that they were not typing on the community document. And I kind of encouraged the teachers to share that document as a view only so that no one accidentally did start doing their presentation on the original. But it was really important for them to know um, how to save a document when it's been shared with you so that you can do um, what you need to do with your project. And that was really exciting to get to that point and for them to just you know have that presentation template right there in front of them. And they were kind of off and running. And so um, that was really cool. They, they just blew me away. They were just so into um, doing their research and dumping information in there and finding their citations and putting in pictures. And so we spent some time in class um, just kind of with me as a resource to kind of keep them moving forward and answer questions. So that was really kind of a cool, cool end result um, of the whole process was having those teachers who were ready with something that they wanted the kids to do. So they got to use those skills right away. Um, one thing I did do for our teachers was because I had all those kids in my classes, I went ahead and I created a contact list or a contact group for each one of my classes. And then um, I exported that and then emailed it to the teachers. And um, a couple teachers went ahead and imported it into their own contacts. A couple teachers I went in and I did it for them just so that because now they were everybody was on Google, the teachers could start sharing documents communicating with the kids, and that kind of just got the ball rolling a little bit faster. So it was um, just kind of an extra thing that I did. I knew I wanted to be able to communicate with the class as a whole, so I just shared that um, list with the teachers to save them from having to go and find all of their kids and create their own list. So, And that graphic kind of shows you the process of 
um, how that works. And that's kind of a, a cool extra just to kind of share that information. Um, one of the things that really surprised me about Google, um, with 125 fourth graders, I really struggled with the fact that I didn't get to talk to every student every time or really make a connection. And Google Apps really provided me another avenue of visiting with kids and making connections. And I love this email. It just, I look at it on days when I'm having not such a great day. Um, spelling errors and grammar errors, I, the whole thing, I love the whole thing because it was something that this student would never have said to me face to face. Um, this was just a student that I, I talked to, but I didn't really feel like I had a connection. And I got this email one day that just said, hey, um, these are all the things I want to tell you. And that is such an amazing tool. Um, and it was very unexpected. And so all of the things that we went through and all of the craziness of, of changing temporary passwords and creating standard passwords and getting everybody in and getting everybody out and teaching them about Drive and um, just, you know, it, get, it got pretty wild for a few days. But then the end result was, you know, I had kids that I do talk to and I do get to have a connection with, but that kind of broadened um, the scope of who I had a connection with because a lot of my kiddos that I don't get to talk to or this wouldn't maybe talk to me in person, they were sending me emails and they were sending their teachers emails. And so we had this great conversation going that we could model good digital citizenship, but we could also um, keep that, that relationship and that connection with them going if they had questions. And I did have a couple kids who emailed me over a weekend. They were working on their plan a presentation and they got stuck and they sent me a quick email and said, I think I just did something wrong and um, I'm not sure what to do. And so they really got to see firsthand that um, we meant what we said when we said, email us and we'll help you if you have a question. So that was kind of a cool, unexpected um, result of um, sharing Google with kids um, at that level. So Google Classroom. Um, this I am so excited about. It is um, actually going to be in beta. Um, I went ahead and applied for an invitation and in I think June they're going to roll out to a few or several or however many educators and let them kind of take a look at Google Classroom. My, my impression from what I've read and what they've shared with people is that it will be kind of like a blackboard kind of like an angel environment where kids can go in and they will have their classes and they can um, have documents shared with them in kind of a contained environment. So I'm going to say very similar to Blackboard and Angel. And they're going to roll that out to some educators in June. And then it sounds like there'll be a full rollout in September to Google, App, um, Google Apps for Education Schools. And other than that, I haven't seen a lot. They haven't said a lot. So I'm kind of just hoping with my fingers crossed that when June rolls around that I get an email where I can get in there and really dig around. Um, I think that as powerful as Google is with the idea and the concepts of sharing and communication, I think that this classroom um, component is going to take it to an entirely new level. And just, you know, you're going to have their ability to um, communicate. They will be working in a real world platform and just have some really great skills um, when they come out of um, our classrooms into the world because they will have already used um, this suite of products. So are there any questions? Great, Cynthia. That sounds uh, wonderful and I'm, I'm glad it's been uh, such a success. Um, anybody in the audience who has a question, feel free to either type that into the Q&A area. Krista will be monitoring those, or mm -hmm. you can type in uh, unmute me if you have a microphone. We will happily listen to your wonderful voice. Um, not many yes. people do that, but we, we like to encourage. Um, so I, while we're uh, having some, uh, hopefully some questions come in, I've, I've always got several because, you know, uh, that's my job. Um, and I, the, the first question I had was, are you a one-to-one -one school or are you relying on um, 
students to have their own access uh, at home, or how, how does that work at your school? That is a great question. We are not a one-to-one -one school. We have um, stationary computer labs in the elementaries as well as some um, mobile labs of laptops and then we'll be getting some iPads in um, the fall in the, our buildings. So we are not one-to-one -one. and one of the things that um, I loved about Google Apps was that we really had the flexibility of we could work in the lab, we could work on a laptop, and if they had a tablet at home, they could download the Drive app and they could do some work at home. Um, the Drive app is not as powerful as the full um, website environment, but you can still get a lot of things done and they are, are ramping that up just about um, almost constantly. So it's becoming more and more powerful and more and more usable. But um, I did have some kids, they had tablets at home, they said, can I download the drive? And I said, yep, download, log in with your login, and your stuff should be right there. And they were able to do that. So um, that is a great question. We were not functioning in a one-to-one -one environment. And so for Google Apps, it's really, if you're not one-to-one, -one, it's a great tool because whatever you have, um, it'll work. And so then I'm, I'm going to assume you've probably got at least some kids without computers at home in, in one format or another, or maybe, you know, maybe everybody does. I, I don't know. Um, but if so, how, how is that working? Has there been any noticeable impact, or have they been able to get enough access uh, on uh, campus? Generally, in my experience um, at Lakeview and at Fremont, you know, you, we do not have 100% Internet access for our students. And so I was, you know, we were very cautious about the, um, the projects that the kids were doing, and particularly here in Fremont. Um, things were not required of them outside of class. Um, they made sure that they had time to work during school. If you chose to work at home, that was fine. If you had that access and you were motivated to do that, that was absolutely fine. It was not something that was required because we are aware that we do have kiddos that don't have that kind of access outside of school. And when I was working um, with kids at Lakeview, um, the library was open when I was there and you know we had computer access for them. So if they were able to kind of manage their time during the school day, they were able to get everything done that they needed to get done. And, um, but that was something that we were very aware of. Um, across the board in my experience sharing Google Apps with students is being very mindful of the fact that not all of our kids are going to have that internet access um, outside of school. Mm -hmm. And had you in, in with that had you uh, have you talked or worked with the public library at all? I'm, I'm assuming they have internet access. <laughs> I have a feeling we did have some kids that went to the public library and logged on and did some work there. I know in Columbus I did have some kids. Um, I, um, we partnered with them, um, the Columbus Public Library, um, on some different things and so I would kind of hear or the kids would say, um, some of them went to McDonald's, some of them went to the public library um, here in Fremont, they can go and they can use those computers. So that was a great partnership because the kids knew they could get to a computer at a public library and they knew they could get to Google and they knew they could log in so they could do their work pretty much wherever they could get internet access. Okay, um, how about the back end, getting this all set up, working with the, with the rest of the staff on campus, who, who's actually doing the administration of all this? It's a very open-ended question here, but, you know, <laughs> so, somebody who wants to do this, obviously, you know, there, there was much more than, you, you picked it up where it's all installed and it's running, now let's work with the kids. How, can you talk about before all that? Um, here at um, Fremont, our tech department kind of coordinated all of the accounts and set up the access and, and kind of put all of that together. And then when um, things were kind of ready, um, they let our um, curriculum director, Darren Calverlau, know and he kind of shared that information um, with us as a department. I was ready and raring to go, you know, whenever. I, as soon as this stuff's ready, I'm ready to go, let's go. 
And so I was really excited when they, we kind of got the thumbs up that the accounts are ready, the, the levels of access, um, you know, everything that you have to do on the technical end was taken care of. And then we were kind of ready to go at Lakeview. Um, I got to work pretty closely with our um, technology coordinator, Tracy Briggs, and the ESU um, guys. And that was kind of, um, it was all kind of set up, you know, on the technical end. Um, and then, you know, Tracy and I kind of worked together if we ran into some techni technical issues. I was not part of, you know, setting up who has access to what and how are we going to determine, you know, what they can do, when they can do it. Um, one thing I will say is that at the elementary level in the K-4, their email was only internal. They were only able to email um, individuals from FPS. So we did not have that open to the whole world. And then progressing through the higher grades, that access gets opened up a little bit as they um, progress through the district. But um, at K-4, their access for email um, for fourth graders is only within the district, only FPS um, individuals. And I can't remember if third grade might be the same and then anything younger than that. I don't believe that they had email. They might have just had docs. So all of that was set up through the technology department and I know that that was a tremendous undertaking. So um, I was just really excited and grateful that they were, you know, they got it going so that we could um, share that with the fourth graders before they left our buildings and headed to Johnson Crossing and hopefully that would give them um, a bit of a running start. But we did, um, like I said, kind of ask, can we have access to reset passwords? We felt like that was going to be probably the one issue that we were going to be bugging them about the most, and they have a lot of stuff to do with um, managing our networks and the equipment, so that was one thing um, we were kind of hoping we could take off their plate. So they did do that. They were able to kind of give us that level of access so we could um, take care of those issues without having to go through them and bug them with stuff like that. Well, you make a really good point there. I think beyond just setting up the tech, it sounds like a lot of um, policy decisions need to be made as, as part of setting up a, a, a system like this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and in hmm. a bigger district, that was kind of all, you know, they had to determine that. There were, I think, a lot of conversations. In fact, I'm sure there were a lot of conversations about, you know, how do we want this to look and where do we want it to go. Um, and in a smaller district, you know, that might have been, um, the media specialist might have been involved in that. But um, my experience here was, you know, those decisions had to be made um, ahead of time. And I'm glad for that because um, they tried to address every possibility um, that they could before we rolled it out to the kids so that it was um, a learning experience and not a technical issue. So, so now it's, it's time for my, uh, I always have like, there's always this one awkward question, which, which is, was there any pushback? You, you implied that, you know, most of the teachers, you know, really got into it. Were, were there any parents or teachers or anybody kind of going, nah, I don't want to do this? I did not have um, any experience with that. Um, like I said, I, I was like, you know, if you want to pilot this, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do it. Um, and that's just kind of me. If you know me at all, I'm not really one to sit back and go, well, let's see what happens. I'm like, no, let's be first. Let's do it. And so um, I don't know if that, that enthusiasm um, transferred just to my immediate circle. I have no idea. But um, I really wanted it to be a great experience, and I was so excited. Um, I did not have any um, communication from parents who said, no, we don't want this. They kind of, they knew ahead of time last fall it was um, shared with them as a district that um, these accounts would be coming, um, the students would be using this tool, so um, it wasn't um, something that um, they kind of got blindsided by. They, I mean, they kind of knew at some point you know, everybody's going to have this resource. And for fourth grade, it just took us probably till February or March to kind of get everything in place and roll it out. But um, I was, you know, saying back in September, yeah, I'll try it. Let me try it. 
<laughs> I'll get 25 kids in a class. I'll do it. We'll try it. We'll see what happens. And um, that's just kind of me. So I, I am happy to say that, that it was a great experience. And, and when people really realized how powerful it was, um, the excitement kind of spread. And, you know, we had um, teachers that didn't um, really think about it initially. We're like, you know, yeah, let's do this. Let's, this is going to be awesome. Um, so, like I said, the excitement kind of spread and, and made it a great experience, which was, was what I was hoping for. Well, good. I'm, I'm, I'm always, you know, happy to hear that there weren't any uh, uh, stick in the muds or something in, in the process. So, so that's a great thing. So one of the things, especially when you were, you were talking uh, early on in your presentation about kind of digital citizenship and, and things like that, and I, I kind of made a, a snarky comment to Krista that, you know, but they're all digital natives. Don't they already know how to do all this stuff? Um, and obviously we know better than that, um, but you know, you, you do get that. What, were, were there any things that really kind of stuck out as maybe surprised you that they didn't know or are you know, the, the kind of questions that just caught you off guard? Um, you know, and I found this kind of across the board as I've taught digital citizenship to kids. Um, the concept of, I can't see you, therefore I can say whatever I want, um, that never ceases to amaze me that they have that impression. And I don't know if it's because they are digital natives, but that's one of the reasons why I am just so passionate about putting that digital citizenship component right in front of them so that we address um, how powerful you know this technology is and how powerful it is to be constructive and get things done and to do good things and not to um, hurt other people or to say things that you shouldn't say but that is the one thing that um, across the board um, you know k-12 that I find kids um, a lot of kids just have that impression that if I can't see you, I can say whatever I want, and, and that's not okay. And so I always tell them, if you wouldn't say it to grandma, don't say it, because you can't take it back. And we talk a lot about, <laughs> you know, um, what you put out there now can come back to haunt you. You know, um, employers are going to check you out before they ask you to come into an interview. And if you've got stuff out there that's, um, you know, unkind or inappropriate, um, it's going to come back. And yeah, you are 11 years old right now, but, you know, you need to be thinking about who you are going to become um, in the future. And, and there's um, an awesome librarian, um, the Daring Librarian, and she talks about how um, Facebook kind of came back and bit her. Um, after she became a mover and shaker in the library world and some stuff that was out there kind of came back to haunt her and you know she tried to go in and, and delete it but it was tagged and um, you know she turned it into a really great digital citizenship lesson for, for us as professionals and for her kids and one of the things that I, I do is I really try to um, model good digital citizenship um, and I talk about, you know, I've been really mad at somebody and I wanted to fire off a tweet and, you know, but I, I didn't, you know, or I, you know, just wanted to say something really snarky to somebody on Twitter and, and I just, I didn't. And I'm always, um, they know that I will show them my Twitter account. We can take a look at it. We'll see what I'm talking about. Um, for the most part, they find out I'm pretty boring, so they're I'm not worth following. But... Um, I'm okay with showing it to them because everything I do is professional and, and I really try to model um, that good di digital citizenship to them because I really want them to understand that what they say does not go away and you can't say whatever you want even though you're not looking right at that person. Yeah, and I think it's it's good to teach them that now while the system that they're using is kind of a closed system and it's not really out there um, exactly. to do that. And uh, exactly. I, have a follow, I have a follow up to that, but I want to remind everybody that we'll happily uh, take questions from the audience. We don't seem to have gotten any in yet, but just to go ahead and type it in the questions area. Um, here, some of the things you were, you were saying in that, I was wondering if you had a rough idea. Most services like 
regular Gmail and Twitter and Facebook, you're supposed to be 13 before you can sign up. Mm -hmm. Do you have an impression as to like what percentage of your students, even though we're talking 10, 11, 12 year olds, already are on these services anyway? Um, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, in fourth grade, I, I don't have a real, real good, um, real good working knowledge of maybe who my kids are, who are. Um, when I taught five, six, and then seven, twelve, um, you know, they were pretty clear about, yeah, we're on, and I like it, but you're not. Nope, we're on. We're, you know. We, we said we, we were 13 and we got on, so um, there is not a lot I can do about that once they're on. So I really want to make sure that um, we're, we're catching them and really reiterating um, the good digital citizenship skills and really thinking about our footprint before they get too far into their teen years. Mm -hmm. um, and I know fourth grade might not seem like a you know, like, oh, we, you know, they don't, a lot of them don't have devices, and so we're not, you know, we don't need to worry about it. But this is really a great time to start talking about it because when they, the devices are in their hands later on, they're thinking about, yep, you know what, we talked about that, and this is probably not a good thing for me to send out into the, into the digital Twitter sphere. And you know, I need to think about who I am, and so maybe catching them before the devices are in their hands is is a great um, thing to do. I don't think that you can start too early. I've talked to my kindergartners about you know how do we use the internet, how do we stay safe, and then you know just kind of working my way through um, one, two, three, and four, just um, which is why I love common sense media because they really lay it out for you and help you with you know, lessons that are, and activities and videos that are very great and age specific. So you can really go there and say, okay, I'm going to teach the kindergartners and we're going to talk about digital citizenship. What's appropriate for that group? That Where, where do we need to start? And once you start that conversation, um, I, I just hope, you know, that you can stop some of the negativity before it starts. Um, and have, have you read Dana Boyd's book, It's Complicated, yet? I don't think I have. Oh, you should. <laughs> I will add that to my reading list. Yeah, it's, it's the, 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 the social life of networked teens. So it's a little uh, older than the group we're talking about now, but, but uh, you said you were going to be moving up. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, she's, she's been working with teens and talking about how they deal with privacy and how they deal with technology, and it, it's, it's very eye-opening and... Uh, I'm about halfway through it. I, I highly suggest it to any, anybody on this call. Uh, it's complicated by Dana Boyd. Um, and I have just w uh, one last question. And uh, you, you mentioned your Twitter stream. And uh, when, when you started your presentation, Chris has been monitoring Twitter and noticed you. You tweeted on our show. Thank you very much. Um, but, but we have one question from that tweet. That, that okay. You used a hashtag we couldn't identify. Um, and it was FPS TTWT. We're just wondering if we can be nosy and, and, and uh, you could explain what that hashtag is. Absolutely. Um, I am, um, you know, you, get, you have another hour. We can talk about Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm talking about Twitter tomorrow in Norfolk. Oh, um, there you go. When I came to Fremont, one of the things I forgot to ask was, um, can I still tweet? <laughs> And um, at Lakeview, I had my personal Twitter account, and then I also had a library Twitter account. And, and it was because I had older students, and I knew at Fremont in K-4, um, Twitter was probably not going to be a variable for me. But I wanted to be able to share the cool stuff that we were doing and the stuff I was teaching the kids and the things that they were making um, through Twitter. So I um, asked permission from... Um, the administrators and said, you know, um, this is, you guys know this is kind of who I am and, and can I do this? And they got back to me with, you know, the parameters um, because ultimately we want to keep the kids safe and we don't want to, um, you know, compromise them in any way so that I had some parameters, which I generally followed anywhere, any way I don't show kids' faces. Um, I don't name names, but I'll show stuff they did or lots of the backs of their heads. Just because I feel like, you know, if we don't tell our story, 
as a district, somebody else will. And I want to make sure people know that we are doing great stuff every day for kids. So FPS um, TTWT is a group of teachers um, here at Fremont Public Schools that work with Darren Kalberlau, um, who is the curriculum director, and it's um, we kind of are working on uh, how to integrate technology into teaching and um, just what are, what's cool out there, what can we use, what can we share with our staff. And um, I've done some tech sessions at my buildings just to share some cool tools. And then the other um, hashtag, which I didn't use, is FPS Connect, which um, I kind of bugged um, one of the administrators who's going to be one of my administrators next year and said, you know, we need a hashtag for the district. We need to start that hashtag now and start using it so that as more people get involved and more people want to share the cool things we're doing, we've got a hashtag and we've kind of branded our district. Um, a lot of districts in Nebraska have done that, York Dukes and um, EM Wolves and NPS Panthers, and so I was like, Fremont needs a hashtag. So that's the other hashtag I didn't use, but FPS TTWT is a, just a group of people that um, I am honored to work with at Fremont Public Schools who are as passionate as I am about um, integrating technology. So whenever I, there's something cool with education and technology, I tweet that out and tag that, and they, they know that um, I'm trying to get their attention. <laughs> All right, and I guess according to Krista, we have gotten a question from we the do. audience. Yes, we have a, a question. Um, it says, I'm wondering about the blocks of time that were devoted to each day that you mentioned. Our library system, this is someone from a public library, um, our library system does outreach in the schools but would normally get an isolated hour. Um, this could be used to introduce the concept of digital citizenship, but what was the actual time commitment for the teachers and the timeline to carry out the whole project? Um, like I said, I see my kids 30 minutes for um, media class, library media class, um, in twice in a five cycle day, um, or five day cycle. So um, everything I did kind of had to be broken down into blocks of 30 minutes. And so that's kind of why the first day all we did was log in, log out. Second day we got logged back in, sent an email. Um, next day we looked at Drive. So I had um, less than an hour, um, and you know, for this age group, that was probably about right because it's pretty intense. You know, getting logged in and, and your username and, and the extension fpsmail.org and remembering all of where the dot goes and the at goes. Um, so for this age group, um, 30 minutes was probably appropriate just the little chunks of time and like I said I see them twice a week so I did see them fairly regularly um, so we could kind of keep that stream of learning going. Um, older kids, you know, an hour would probably be okay because they, they kind of start moving a little quicker and um, but that's, that's kind of the time frame that I had mm -hmm. and um, looking back and I hadn't really thought about it until now but looking back I would say that was probably appropriate for the age of kids that I was working with because it, it was pretty intense. It was a lot of information, a lot to look at, and for some of them it was the first time they'd ever seen anything like that. So, you know, I didn't want to overwhelm them to the point that they were like, oh, I'm not doing this again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. And um, what about the timeline for the whole project from when you first got the idea to when you're, you know, when I guess it was full in effect, how, how, how was that? Oh, wow. Um, it kind of gets a little muddled because um, I'm going to say we probably had six 30-minute class periods to kind of get inter introduce it, get started, kind of get our feet under us. And then um, I probably, I think I gave um, them another two class periods as work time for their presentations and I was kind of collaborating with the teachers and that was really based on um, did they have time during their class day for the kids to work on stuff or did they need to use that time um, with me to um, work on those presentations and at that point I was clearly just a resource you know they were working um, looking for information, putting pictures in, refining their presentations, and I was there just to answer questions, give them some guidance, look it over, that kind of stuff. So um, 
you know, eight class periods was probably about a month for me, would be two class periods per week and four weeks. So I would say, you know, about a month. And then we kind of ran into the, our testing window. So um, that then it was just kind of hit and miss wherever, you know, we could fit time in. So I would say, you know, about a month. Cool. Good. Well, Cynthia, this is wonderful. Please tell me you submitted this to conference for the fall. <laughs> I have not. Oh, you really should. <laughs> oh, you should. And and I've got to say, um, more power to you for doing this. Um, you know, 10, 11 year olds and this stuff is uh, is got to be a, a challenge, but re rewarding when it works. So, uh, they, like I said, they will blow you away. They I, will leave that first day knowing you you pretty sure that you have probably made a huge mistake, and then come back the second day, and you know we were off and running, and I was so proud of them, you know. And they would say, "Oh, I'm gonna change my background and my email. Um, can you look at this? Is this appropriate? Does this look okay?" I'd be like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I'm going to think about that. And, you know, so they were asking proactive questions and saying, okay, I'm, I'm not sure. And that's what I want. I want them to ask me. If you're not mm -hmm. sure, ask me. And so I, I was just kind of the messenger. They are by far the stars of this whole show because they, um, they took it and they ran with it. And it turned into, we went from, this is really cool, and I can talk to my friends to, this is really cool, look at all the stuff I can get done. And that is what I wanted from, from the whole experience. So they are by far, by far, the stars of this show. All right. Well, I, I think with that, we will wrap it up. Uh, thank you, uh, Cynthia, for that. That was, that was uh, everything I hoped for and more. I, I'm glad it's going so well. Um, and uh, with that, uh, you're welcome to stay on the line. We're just going to kind of wrap up the show here. I'm going to hand it back over to Krista. Uh, I don't really have any news uh, this month, really. The, the, the only thing is um, yet another password hack. If you've got an eBay account and you haven't changed your password yet, uh, please change your password because you need to. Um, so with that, that's going to be the end of this month's uh, Tech Talk. Okay. Did you hang on a sec here? Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, Michael and Cynthia. That was great. We just have one comment. Awesome presentation, Cindy. Laura Hess says. <laughs> um, there we go. There we go. That's what I wanted. Um, so, yes, that will wrap it up for uh, this week's Encompass Live. The show has been recorded, so it will be available later today. When I get some. Today, tomorrow. Um, there we go. So, and I hope you'll join us in our, there's a list of our future shows that we have coming up. I hope you join us next week. We just got this on the schedule. Um, we were not getting, we are having some uh, scheduling issues. But um, next week's show for Encompass Live is going to be me doing a presentation, actually. I'm not bringing anyone on, just me all by myself. Uh, 20 cool tools for you and your library. This is a presentation that I did at our Nebraska Library Association State Conference last fall. And I'm redoing it here on our show to get it out there and recorded. Um, new technologies, new tools, um, online video recording tools, infographic tools, um, let's see, screen recordings, social news sites, collecting videos, any all sorts of big things, uh, 20 of them though, that I'm going to be sharing with you next week, so please do uh, sign up for that. And if you are on, or for any of our other future shows, and if you are on Facebook, and Compass Live is on Facebook as well, just like us there and you'll get notifications of when new shows are coming up. When new things have been added to the schedule, uh, reminders that today's show is starting up, so you can log in on the fly if you want to. So um, if you're a big Facebook user, like us there. Other than that, we are good for today. Thank you very much, and we'll see you um, next week and on future shows on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.